And I trust that uh, our time together in the Word of God will turn to Psalm 63. Psalm 63. I couldn't have uh, asked Paul to do any better uh, this morning, except for the rude jokes he cracked. Um, but uh, he successfully turned our minds and our hearts to the subject of praise to the Lord, and that's uh, what I would like to talk to you about this morning. Actually, uh, from a sort of a different angle, but nevertheless, it's, uh, that's right on target want to praise the Lord this morning. I have uh, been thinking uh, over the last couple of weeks as to what to do with you uh, here on Sunday mornings uh, in the first part of our new year. And I have decided, after praying about it and thinking about it, that I would like to spend a month, anyway, of Sundays, spending a little time in the Word of God and what it has to say about our minds, our minds. It has been said that the, there's a battle for our minds today. There's a book to that effect written by a Christian man, The Battle for the Mind. We see it uh, very dramatically being played out in our society, The Battle for the Mind. The schools no longer want students, for example, exposed only to Christian teaching. Right? They want their minds exposed to the broad range of multi-faith religions. And that has everything to do with the minds of students, for example. Right? The media, which is largely controlled by uh, l very liberal-minded, in many cases radically-minded people, the papers, and the television in particular, and, and radio, uh, are very serious about controlling the way you think. If that were not the case, advertisers would not spend millions of dollars during the football season, for example, or the hockey season, to put 15-second ads in between segments of television. They want you to think a certain way. They want you to act on the way you think. And in the moral and spiritual realm, there is a definite, and a real battle going on for our minds. It's an understatement to say that he who controls the mind controls the person. Not everybody in the battle for your mind is ethical. Not everybody who is seeking control over the way you think uses legitimate means, even in Christian circles. I'll tell you that right now. There is a great deal of hanky-panky going on in the methods by which people are trying to get in between your ears and control your actions from the way, where you go to church to the way you give your money in religious circles. This morning I intend to use a few examples to show you that this is serious business. And it's very apropos to our circumstances. We can, none of us, afford to sit back, relax, let the old mind rip from the neutral, and pretend that we will become spiritually minded people without any effort and without being warned ahead of time. There are key questions in this subject of the mind. When, do, when does legitimate leadership become cultic tyranny? What is the difference between a godly leader who is trying to influence your mind using the scriptures to become godly and Christ-like individual? What's the difference between a person like that and a person that uses wrong methods who is trying to draw away disciples after himself or herself. How do you recognize the difference between such leaders? What are the marks of submission to mental tyranny? Could you identify the danger signs between people that are using methods that are actually illegitimate, dangerous, that enslave people mentally and spiritually? To start with this morning, I want to say that there are four key facts that we must bear in mind in any discussion of the mind. Number one, God created man with a mind. 
I'm using man in the generic sense. I believe women have minds too. I believe that God created us with the expectation that we are to use them. But we are to use our minds submissively to God's authority. There's no better example of this than Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3 where God created Adam and Eve, breathed into Adam the breath of life. God directly gave his immaterial nature to the man unlike the way he gave life to the creatures in the sea and in the air and on the earth. God gave them life too. They have souls, but on a lesser level, to a lesser degree than the kinds of souls and immaterial nature we possess as human beings. So God created man like himself. He breathed directly from himself into man. And then to man alone did God give the responsibility to act in a moral way. You may eat of everything in the garden. It's carte blanche yours with one minor exception. Thou shalt not. And only to man did God give a moral prohibition not to do something because that was the tree of the knowledge of good and the evil. He never forbade the fish to eat plankton. Right? He didn't forbid cows to eat dandelions. He forbade man to participate in a in moral rebellion because God was fully cognizant of the fact that if it hadn't already happened and it's a long debate that it was going to happen in his, in his own spiritual heavens in the heavens that Satan was going to rebel that was no surprise to God nothing is a surprise to God and God knew that man was going to rebel at Satan's instigation so fact number one the mind of people our minds are to be submissive to God's authority. He created these minds to respond to him. Secondly, man rebelled, and God subjected natural men everywhere under satanic blindness. That's another undeniable fact. Why are otherwise intelligent people so ignorant, so morally stupid? Well, there's no other explanation than the fact that their minds are blind, and that's precisely what the scriptures say, right? Second Corinthians chapter four, verse four, that Satan is the god of this age, has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest they should understand the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. Ephesians chapter two, verses one to three, Paul, speaking of Christians, says, "You, as God made alive, who one time before you were made alive were dead in trespasses and sin, and whom the Prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now in works in the children of disobedience caused you to live according to the course of this age, according to the, uh, the flesh. And, and you did by nature, um, you were by nature the children of wrath. It's Satan, a spiritual being, has been given temporarily by God, the sovereign one in control over all things, has temporarily allowed the world of humanity to think thoughts that Satan wants them to think. 1 John 5.19, the whole world lies in the grasp of the evil one. That's my um, paraphrase. The whole world lies in the evil one. Right? A third fact, key fact about our minds, only by regeneration is it possible to think right. Only when you are saved and changed 100%, given new life, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, put into the body of Christ, justified from your sins, sanctified unto God, placed into heavenly spheres with Jesus Christ, seated at the right hand of God, only then do you have the mind of Christ. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, that there is a natural man that thinks natural thoughts. There is a spiritual man that thinks spiritual thoughts. And in describing that individual, he says, we, we spiritual people have the mind of Christ. No one else has it. Unsaved people don't have the mind of Christ, and neither do carnal people, he goes on in the third chapter, who think like natural men, even though they're saved. That's an interesting point. It's, it leads us to the fourth and final point about our minds. The first point is that God created our minds to be submissive to His authority, to His Word. Secondly, our men rebelled historically, and so the whole world has been temporarily subjugated 
to blindness, mentally, intellectually, morally, spiritually, blind. Thirdly, only when a person is saved is he given a spiritual mind. Has, does he have the potential to think God's thoughts after God? And fourthly, just because a person is saved, this is not a guarantee that a person will experience Christ's mind because there are further conditions to experiencing the proper way to think in our daily lives. For example, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 to 11, the Apostle John warns that even Christians can fall into blindness. For example, if he says, if you hate your brother, you automatically walk in darkness and you do not the truth. We can opt out. We can either walk in the light or walk in darkness if we are Christians. It's not a guarantee that my ideas and my values and my outlook are really godly at all. That's a very sobering fact because I see Christians all around me all the time. Not 100%. I'm generalizing. Right? But I see Christians making stupid mistakes, bad decisions, choosing lifestyles, choosing to go places and do things, to spend their money certain ways. I see Christians around me who think just like the world. They think as if they were walking in darkness, not in the light, because they are walking in darkness and not in the light. First, uh, Second Peter, for example, chapter 1. I think this is an appropriate scripture. Hold your finger in Psalm 63 and, and please read with me this passage. It's no better passage to illustrate this fourth key point that to, to think right requires a commitment to the Lordship of Christ and, uh, and great effort on our part. And I'm appealing to you at the outset of this four-part, hopefully, hopefully four-part series on the mind, that you would recognize that being Christ-like in your mind is not an automatic thing. It requires a great deal of effort, continuous effort. And Christians can, be, can get so skewed in their thinking as to be no different than the unsaved person in their lifestyle and actions. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 to 9. Grace be and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Notice that grace and peace come through the knowledge. See, if you, if you just unplug your mind and you come into the door on Sunday morning... You're going to have problems. You're going to have problems. You have to have your mind in gear if you want to grow in grace and experience peace. Your mind, the, you have to know, you have to learn, develop, okay? It says, according as His, God's divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who has called us to glory and virtue, by which, that is by His calling, are given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these promises, the written word of God, you might be partakers of God's divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And notice, besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control patience, to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness to brotherly kindness love and if these things be in you and abound they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ but and here's the great sad reality he that lacks these things Christians Christians who lack these things are blind cannot see afar off they've got no perception they can't plan right they, they can't look ahead they forget that they were purged from their old sins. Christians, there is a war for your mind going on right now. It's no different than it was in 1989 or 1990, but it's going on nevertheless. And it, it bothers me. I mean, this has been an issue that has confronted me for a long time. I, it's very upfront for me because I know the key connection between an open mind, a submissive mind, a spiritual mind for a Christian and, and appropriating the Word of God, because I'm in it all the time. I, I'm teaching, I'm preaching, I'm, you know, discipling. And I know that when my students have a certain kind of a mind, I might as well pack up my books and quit. 
because <laughs> it isn't doing any good. You can't force a person to think right. So that's the appeal to you. Are you thinking right? What kind of a mind do you have? It's a key question. All right, so those are four key qu questions, or four key facts, rather, about the mind. Uh, I, I want to, in the weeks ahead, look at four goals of Christ-like thinking. I think that there probably are others, but uh, at this stage I've identified four in my own thinking and study. The one I'd like to touch on this morning is that if you are a Christ-like person, you will be a worshiper of God. A worshiper of God. Don't turn me off. That is more practical than you can even begin to imagine to be a worshiper of God. If you think right, you will be a worshiper of God. Secondly, uh, Lord willing, next week, if you think right, you will be a holy person. You cannot be a holy person without the proper mindset. Thirdly, if you think right, you can have peace and contentment. But if you don't think right, you'll never have it. Even as Christians. And fourthly, if you think right, you'll be able to serve the Lord. These are the four areas I'd like to focus on the next month that in which there are great uh, and life-altering issues at stake. You know, are you ever going to serve God? Are you ever going to be content? Are you ever going to be holy and clean in your personal life? Are you ever going to be a worshiper of God as He desires? It all depends on how you think your mind. All right? I, say, I said it was a battle. Christianity isn't the only true biblical Christians of which I would number our group here this morning, are not the only people that are interested in your mind. Let me, you know, every cult, every cult. I, to give you a, a dramatic illustration, let me give you an example of Transcendental Meditation. Gordon Lewis, in, what, in a book entitled What Everyone Should Know About TM, says that part of Transcendental Meditation literature say that the process of meditation is effortless. Meditators are said to be attracted to higher levels and move to them naturally. To go to a field of greater happiness is the natural tendency of the mind. The practice of TM is not only simple, but automatic. A former meditator described it like this, let the mind float on a mantra until the conscious mind cannot hold a thought and just drifts off. That's transcendental meditation. Basically, it's like walking into a room and checking your mind with all your baggage at the door and then walking right on in with an open mind, not thinking conscious thoughts, and allowing somebody else to fill you with something. They want your mind. There are millions of people in this country that practice transcendental meditation or similar forms of mind control. James Bornstad, in a book entitled The Transcendental Mirage, discusses the dangers of transcendental meditation techniques of meditation. Three, he says. He says, there is the danger of altered states of consciousness. When a person enters an altered state of consciousness, it is medically a fact that your automatic nervous system is altered. It changes the level of hormones in the hypothalamus at the base of the brain. An altered state of consciousness changes your level of hormones in your brain. And it can, in extreme cases, lead to attempts of suicide. Many examples. I watched a documentary entitled The Gods of the New Age. I think it's Gods of the New Age. Two-hour documentary. Every Christian ought to see it today because we live in a world where this is the issue of the tw of the 21st century, the uh, battle for your mind, and it's an expose of Hinduism, New Age, and cultic groups all over this country that have one thing in common: grab your mind through tyrannical techniques, so they got gotcha. you. Your mind, right? Uh, and uh, in that particular 
video clip, which we have, uh, it actually said there that there have been many, many cases of people committing suicide while doing this sort of thing. Um, another danger is that this sort of meditation techniques can lead to psychological problems. One medical doctor described TM as, quote, self-paved desensitization, end quote, which, if uncontrolled, can lead to the release of massive uncontrolled anxiety. It causes people to run into obsessions and rages inside of themselves that they've buried and had victory over for years. But if they open themselves up to this sort of thing, it all comes back out. Uh, other people can become aware of demonic forces within themselves, not realizing that they've got demons in them. And it drives them nuts when they see this. Other people can produce, uh, this sort of thing can produce in some people the sensation of separation from the material universe, a depersonalization, a loss of individual identity, and an awareness of the, a loss of an awareness of the unifying thread of life. And thirdly, he warns that Messing around with this sort of stuff can lead to dangers with demons. Demons can be contacted. They can and do oppress. They do seek to enter the bodies of meditators. And the founder of modern-day transcendental meditation, the Maharishi Yoga, Mahesh Yoga, uh, himself teaches that there are such things as demons, and that, but he doesn't believe they're very powerful, contrary to what other people are saying. There's an example. This whole book right here is written by two guys, Flo Conway and Jim Siegelman, who are not Christians. They are very critical of evangelical Christianity because they believe that, by and large, modern-day evangelical Christianity is propagating a religion that is basically one and the same in its methodology of grabbing the minds of people to control them, particularly charismatic Christianity. And I wanted to read you something this morning. Uh, if we don't get finished our sermon, we'll continue it next week. But I want you to see this. In 1944, there was a kid born in the States, January 14th. His name was Marjo. He became known as the world's youngest ordained minister. He was, ma he was named Marjo after Mary and Joseph, his, a superstitious name given to him by his mother and father because he was born almost strangled to death with the umbilical cord around his neck. Because of this miracle that the child survived, his parents named him this, and from the very beginning, his parents um, meticulously cultivated his preaching skills. Before he could say Mama and Papa, he was taught to sing Hallelujah. When he was nine months old, his mother taught him the right way to shout glory into a microphone. At three, he could preach the gospel from memory and he received drama coaching and instruction in every performing art from saxophone playing to baton twirling. On Halloween 1948, at the age of four, he was officially ordained and thrust into a wildly successful career as the Shirley Temple of America's Bible Belt. In the following ten years, he preached to packed tents and houses coast to coast. And as enthusiastic audiences flocked to see the miracle child who allegedly received sermons from the Lord in his sleep, owing to his mother's careful training, harsh discipline, indomitable ambition, Marjo's sermons were flawlessly memorized right down to each perfectly timed pause and gesture. Frequent hallelujahs and amens punctuated his performance, which were cleverly promoted with titles such as From Wheelchair to Pulpit or Heading for the Last Roundup, which he preached wearing a cowboy suit. And it goes on to say that he was a financial success. Ten years later, he left when he was a teenager uh, because he was disillusioned with all the hype and the money and all this other garbage that he could see right through because he, was, he wasn't a spiritual person. He was a profiteer. A few years later, he produced a movie which, in which he exposed the... Um, the fraudulence of, of many other people doing the same thing. These guys went and interviewed him. And this is what he said. First thing he said was, I don't have any power. And neither do any of these other guys. Hundreds of people were healed at my crusades, and I know blankety blank well that it was nothing I was doing. Yet, he admits, he remains somewhat baffled by the thousands of souls he helped to, quote, save 
and the numerous illnesses he seemed to have cured. His own insight into his preaching skills was on a decidedly earthly level. Based on his years of training and experience, he located the source of his divine power squarely out of the people who assembled to receive his gifts. You start with a guy, he says, who obviously, obviously has a problem. You've got to begin on that premise. Things haven't worked out for him. He's looking for something or whatever. He goes to one of these revivals. He hears very regimented things. He sees a lot of people glowing around him, people who seem very, very happy. They're all inviting him to come in and join the clique. It looks great. They say, hey, my life was changed, or hey, I found a new job. That's when he's ready to get saved or born again. And once he's saved, they all pat him on the back. It's like he's been admitted to this very special elite little club. He downplayed his own role in these proceedings. As he saw it, the real show was in the audience, and he served as only a conductor. As the preacher, he said, I'm working with the crowd, watching the crowd, trying to bring them to that high point. At a certain time in the evening, I let everything build up to that moment when they're all in ecstasy. The crowd builds up. You have to watch it that you don't stop it. You start off saying, you've heard that tonight's going to be a great night. Then you build the whole pitch and keep it rolling. He's done it a million times. The divine moment of religious ecstasy has no mystical quality at all. It's a simple matter of group frenzy that has its counterpart in every crowd. Hitler was a master of it, by the way. It's the same as rock and roll. He said, you have an opening number with a strong entrance. You go through a lot of old standards, and you build up your hit song at the end. The hit song, however, is spiritual rebirth in his particular case. After you've been saved, Marjo said, the next step is what they call the infilling of the Holy Spirit. They say of the new convert, well, now you're saved, but you've got to get the Holy Spirit. So you, come, so you come back to get the tongues experience. Some people will get it the same night. Others will go for weeks or years before they can speak in tongues. You hear it. You hear everybody at night talking it in the church. They're all saying, we love you. We hope you're going to get it tonight. Then one night you go down there and they all try to get it. And you go into a very much of a trance, not quite a frenzy. It's an incredible experience. You forget all about your problems. You're surrounded by people patting you on the back. We love you. You're accepted in Christ. Relax. And sooner or later he starts to speak it out. Dot, dot, dot. Then everybody goes, that's it, you got it. And the button is pushed, and he will, in fact, start to speak in tongues and just take off. The hand, dial, whatever. And on and on. Um, and he did a demonstration for these guys. He says he learned this. Um, he says, I don't really put this stuff down, he says. It's just that I analyze it. I look at it from a very rational point of view. I don't see it as coming from God and say that at a certain point the Holy Spirit zaps you with a super whammy on the head and you've gone for tongues, and there it is. He says, tongues is a process that people build up. Then as you start to do something, just as when you practice the scales on the piano, you get better at it. This guy came to see the evangelical experience as a form of popular entertainment, a kind of participatory divine theater. Uh... I'm going to try to shorten this a little bit. What drove him out of it was the um, certain disturbing aspects where he'd see people uh, taking advantage of the crowds for money. He said, Moon, Sun Myung Moon is doing the same thing. He's taking it one step further. He's saying that he is the Messiah. Uh, he says it's um, the same whether you're a preacher, a lawyer, a salesman. He says you start off with a person's thought processes and then gradually sway him around to another way of thinking in a very short time. This guy no longer uh, uses his preaching talents for evangelical purposes, but he still uses his skills in areas that have nothing to do with religion. He was campaigning for Jerry Brown, former governor of California, uh, also for the AFC, AFL-CIO. Uh, he gives examples. He said uh, he does about 20 college lectures a year, and I do faith healing demonstrations, but I always make them ask for it. I tell them that I don't believe in it. I use a lot of tricks, and the title of the lecture is Rhetoric, Rhetoric and Charisma. So I've already told them how large masses are manipulated by a charismatic figure. I've given them the whole rap explaining how it's done, but they still want to see it. So I throw it all right back at them. I say, no, you really don't want to see it. And they say, oh, yes, we do, we do. And I say, but you don't believe in it anyway, so I can't do it. And they say, we believe, we believe. So after about 20 minutes of this, I ask for a volunteer, and I have a girl come up, and I say, so you want to feel better? And I say, you're lying to me. You're just up here for a good time. You want to impress all these people. You want to make a fool out of me and a fool out of this whole thing. So why don't you go back and sit down? I really get hard on her. And she says, no, no, I believe. And I keep going back and forth until she's almost in tears. And then, even though this is a college crowd and I'm only doing it as a joke, I just say the same old line in the name of Jesus and I touch her on the head and wham, they all fall down flat every time. Now, that probably doesn't explain everybody out there. 
in fact these guys go on and say that they have interviewed lots of people that have had uh, supernatural experiences and their minds have been they that's why they call it snapping because uh, sudden personality change is what they're interested in, in discovering here and uh, people fooling with other people's minds and this guy was doing it just through normal natural laws of crowd control a, a very incisive understanding of the way the human mind works in crowd dynamics right but there are people that go farther than that into the spiritual realm now some of you may not have liked this um, and uh, I don't want to seem uh, what I'm trying to do is to warn you that I my own personal opinion is I think a lot of what's out there even in evangelical Christianity is fake and uh, there's no denying that there are people pulling stunts like this and you may have you may be here this morning because you like the crowd you may be here for all the wrong reasons this morning you may think you're a Christian you may think that you've been able to worship God to get on the right team when all you were looking for was just a pat on the back and friendship Christians are supposed to provide a pat on the back they're supposed to provide friendship and love aren't they if somebody comes in here and you don't talk to them you're wrong <laughs> all right we are supposed to do that but when people come here what it boils down to is you don't come here to have a, a personality change or to feel good because of the group dynamics it's the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ you believe in the message of Christ that's real and I don't have to holler and, and build up a frenzy here in the quietness of your heart I could start at the beginning of the meeting and challenge you to simply put your faith in Jesus Christ and your life can be altered by a sovereign God who loves you who promises through his word to work in miraculous ways through his operation not through crowd dynamics understand every one of us needs that we need God to change our lives through his son Jesus Christ now I started out just to give you an illustration of the fact that there are religious people and secular people that are messing with people's minds today and I'm particularly concerned with people in the cultic realms and in pseudo evangelicalism today who are messing with people's minds and people think they've got a spiritual high they think they've they've arrived they think they've been filled with the spirit when in reality it was crowd dynamics working on their psyche and they're not spiritual at all and I'm afraid that many of us today growing up in a milieu like this don't even understand what it means to be spiritual we don't think right and we can't worship God right because we don't think right we can't really praise the Lord from the bottom of our hearts there's no real joy there it's a it's a painful ritual it's a painful exercise to sing praise the Lord a lot of people stay away from breaking the bread used to be a picture up there uh, a lot of people won't go to the Eucharist there's another name for the same thing right a lot of people won't can't sit down and quiet and meditate and reflect in a biblical manner because they've never learned how they don't know how to worship God they don't have a mind like Christ wants us to have a mind now, I'm not talking about come in the door check your mind with your baggage up there and then allow me to fill it with anything I want we have to have a mind like David right Psalm 63 I want to read it this morning I'll make a few comments I'm not going to expose all these verses but David serves as a prime example of a person who thought right and in the scriptures he's held up to be the man after God's own heart man he was he was a true worshiper of God if you ever met a person that was a true worshiper of God it was David Psalm 23 describes uh, not second Samuel chapter 23 verses 2 and 3 describes him as the sweet psalmist of Israel and he probably wrote more of the Bible than any other single person <laughs> the Holy Spirit used this man to write more of the Bible I'm telling you that David's mentality is the sort of mentality that we have to cultivate in our own lives. We have to be willing to take a real hard look at ourselves and ask ourselves, do I think right? And I'm convinced that a lot of Christians here and everywhere, I struggle with it myself. I don't think I think right. 
completely. I know I don't. A hundred years ago, it was nothing for people to pray until they had calluses on their knees. They spent that much time in prayer. A hundred years ago, the average hobby was reading theology among religious people. Reading theology. Right? Today, we don't have time. We choose not to have time. There are too many other things that just crowd it out, man. Television fills our hours of the day. It's 24-hour programming. 24-hour program. You can go through an entire 24-hour cycle with not a single moment of personal quiet. And it's no wonder we don't know how to think because we're just being blasted and bombarded on every side. Radio, television, books. Um, as much as I like Louis L'Amour, as much as I like Bodhi Tone, as much as I like, I, no, as much as my mother likes Grace Livingston Hill, as much as you might like uh, the Hardy Boys, you know, and the Mandy books, and uh, what you can escape from reality in just about any dimension you wish today, the written page, radio, or the visual news, or, you know, television. You can escape from it all, or drugs. If you don't like any of those, you can take drugs, or booze. You don't have to face reality today. And Christians have grown up with this. I'm used to it. That We don't question it. And we bumble on as unspiritual people that don't know how to worship God. We do not know how to worship God. That's why we were created. We were created to worship God. No other reason. We are here to bring glory to God. And if you don't bring glory to God... You have no reason for being. If there's one thing that we ought to cultivate, it's the ability to worship God. Psalm 63. Oh God, David says, you are my God. Early in the will I seek thee. My soul thirsts for thee. My flesh longs for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see your power and your glory as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because you have been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth close behind thee. Thy right hand upholds me. But those who seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for foxes, but the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that swears by him shall, shall glory, but the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. It's obvious in these 11 verses that we have a contrast between two kinds of people. Those that praise God, those that don't. David is the first group, right? Early will I seek thee. The first eight verses described continuous, David's con personal continuous pledge and commitment to worshiping God day by day, by day, regardless of where he is. And it's highly significant that in the 63rd Psalm, David was probably, probably wrote this at the time that he was chased out of Jerusalem where the temple was. Not the temple, his, the tabernacle. David had been chased out by his own son, Absalom, who, and it caused a civil war. It split the nation Israel 10 centuries before Christ. And David was fleeing for his life eastward across the Jordan River to a place called Mahanaim, up in the steppes in the desert highlands east of the Jordan River. And there he's sitting in the desert. He's separated from the tabernacle. He doesn't have an opportunity really to offer sacrifices to God as was his daily custom. He was a man after God's own heart. We know David was in the temple all the time, worshiping, bringing sacrifices according to the Mosaic Law. He was doing it right. He was a specimen, uh, an example of a man who knew how to worship God. And now he was paying for his sins with Bathsheba. His own son drove him out and moved in with his concubines in the palace. David was separated from the temple, and in this difficult situation, David says, I'll still seek the Lord. I'll still be worshiping you. I, believe that, I don't believe that worship is confined to breaking the bread. I'd never have. I don't believe it. Nobody should ever draw that conclusion. The only time you can worship God is at the Lord's Supper. You should be able to worship God in the quietness of your heart when you're driving the car. You know, when you're taking a bath. 
when you're combing your hair, you know, when you're uh, mixing bread dough, you know, whatever. You can't, it would be pretty difficult to do it when you're watching television, you know, or listen to the radio. You just, you just have to do that. You have to be some kind of person <laughs> to be able to worship God and listen to garbage at the same time. You know. Well, David's personal pledge to commitment was for four reasons. Verse 1, he, he was eagerly, diligently seeking God because the world didn't satisfy. David describes his world, and it's literal there. He was sitting in the desert, and he says, My flesh longs for thee in a dry and a thirsty land where no water is. The desert where David sat at the time he penned these words was symbolic of the natural world where all men are blinded by sin, right? There's no water there. It's dry. It's a thirsty land. Some people are buying into that. A lot of people are buying into the world today. The world will not satisfy. Only Christ. Come unto me, all you that thirst, Jesus said, and you'll never thirst again. Okay? If you keep your eyes on the Lord. It's possible for us to take a drink, put down the glass, walk back into the darkness, out in the desert. Don't want any more water, Lord. Thanks. I'll try to find it out there. See? David recognized that the world didn't satisfy. I mean, Solomon, his own son, David, these guys are given to us by the Holy Spirit to prove to us, to teach us that, look at things will not satisfy. Solomon, the book of Ecclesiastes is in the Bible that teaches this very point, right? Solomon said, I multiplied buildings. I got all kinds of women. He says, I didn't find one that satisfied. You read that, the book of Ecclesiastes. I think it's about the fifth chapter. He, he, had, he had 600 wives plus concubines. And at the end of all that, when he, book, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, he says, I didn't find one satisfied. Not one. There's, there's a man that thirsted for an intimate relationship with a woman that he never found her. Because he did it the world's way. Right? Not God. Right? So, money, women, material things, enjoyment, wisdom, philosophy, all of that doesn't satisfy. <coughs> That's what God says. Now, you can believe it or disbelieve it, but that's what God says. David said, the world doesn't satisfy. It's a dry and thirsty land. My flesh longs for you, Lord. Early will I seek you. Verse 2, David committed himself to personal worship of the Lord because he had already had glimpses of the Lord in the sanctuary. Now, he wasn't anywhere near the sanctuary. He was 50 miles away in the desert. No hope of walking down to the tabernacle this afternoon and offering... Uh, his lamb or his ram or his uh, goats or whatever. He couldn't go down there. He couldn't listen. He couldn't bring a priest over and sit down and have a good conversation. He couldn't listen to the man exposit the word of God to him. David says, to see your power and your glory as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. David had had glimpses. He did know the Lord a little bit. He had been there. He had seen it. And I don't think there's probably every, any one of us, every one of us here probably could admit that there have been times in our lives when we, more than any other time, really got a real closeness with the Lord, intimate glimpse, got to know Him a little bit better. You know, Something which struck us about Him that never hit us before, that we have, now we understand Him a little bit better. You know where I'm coming from? There are times, right? Now David isn't in a situation like that. And he, he harks back to that and says, I know it's there. So I'm going to continue on seeking because I know I have had times before. Verse 3 through 7. David commits himself to this because of God's historical faithfulness to him. You know, your own day-by-day -day experience, answered prayer, seeing God work in other people's lives, hearing the testimony of other Christians. That's one of the reasons why we gather together here so that we can build one another in our faith by our own personal testimony. Seeing God at work in our witness, seeing other people come to the Lord, that's vital. That's our personal history. Without that, there's no confidence that God is going to reveal Himself to us in the future. And as we read verses 3 and following, He says, Your loving kindness is better than life. I will bless thee while I am living. Verse 5, My soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fat.